Hello, good evening, good afternoon, good morning, wherever you are. This morning, or well, my time this evening, Mark's time, gives me extreme pleasure to introduce you to one of the fitness industry's greatest, somebody that I've been learning from since 2005, 2006-ish, is when we first crossed paths with the Czech stuff. And if you don't know what that is, we'll explain in a moment. But Mr. Mark Buckley, for most people watching this probably needs no introduction. I'm going to introduce him anyway, and then I'm going to let him finish the introduction as well. So you probably know Mark as the founder of the FMA Institute. He's formerly senior faculty of also the Czech Institute, where he's traveled the world teaching those courses, and we'll explain what that is in a moment. So his career has expanded across very varied disciplines as well, from starting out wanting to get big in the gym when he was a teenager and taking steroids, his words, to become part of a team of specialists where he was responsible for rehabilitation within Wellington Hospital, to then owning his own Olympic gym near Dunedin in New, New Zealand. I nearly said New South Wales. He's trained numerous big names from rugby players to mixed martial artists, and he's taught many of the big names in the fitness industry today that people know from online because they do marketing well. Many of these attribute their knowledge to him, and I won't mention any names, but we might get him to drop a few, but he makes sure that he doesn't because he's incredibly humble. The version of him that we see today is actually a world-renowned presenter for the fitness industry and FMA, and feel free to expand on this better for me, please, Mark, combines rehab with strength and conditioning to get performance and clients' results faster and more applicable and safe, safer than a lot of courses. He's currently residing in the Dominican Republic with his beautiful wife, Kimmy. Is there anything that I've missed, Mark? Um, no, no, you did, a, you did a really good job, actually. But, you know, you did touch upon, you know, I've trained some of the, the big names in Australia and you wanted me to sort of name drop a, a few. So I'll just start off by saying, I think probably the biggest name I've, I've been responsible or had an input in would be this lady in Australia called Kate Martin. She's pretty impressive. <laughs> what was that? Anyway, <laughs> thanks. You asked me to say He's that. He's going to be uncomfortable talking okay. about himself, folks. So I have to, I'm going to have to put up with deflection the entire time. So Mark, what, can you expand on what got you into the industry in the first place? Because in doing research about Mark, I also realised that I, I couldn't find any public material about his story. So I wanted to bring everyone his story today. But I also know that just because of the way um, he delivers material is this is going to be beneficial for not just fitness professionals of any level, beginner and experience, but also for, you know, the average gym goer or any of our clients. Like I know that my old personal training clients are going to benefit from the things that you say as well, because his take on life is realistic, holistic, uh, and very down to earth, but his knowledge is far surpasses a lot of, a lot of industry experts but he won't come across like that. So if he, if he says some big words, he'll also explain what they mean. So how did you get into the industry, Mark? How did I get into the industry? It, it was interesting. I mean, as, as a child, I was always sort of gravitating towards, you know, training and, and fitness and health, even though I was a little chubby kid. But, you know, I had this, this big heart. I remember I was watching the Rocky movie when I was about 13, I first saw it. And it was just the music and the training and all that. I thought, wow, I'd love to do that. But I kind of thought I'm too pretty to, to be a fighter. So I thought I'd like to be like a coach like Mickey and, and train fighters and, you know, and have that sort of role and responsibility. And that sort of got me interested in training. So I got my first sort of weight set, you know, like around sort of 14. And a little few years, fast forward a few years later, I saw Pumping Iron with Arnold Schwarzenegger. See, I'm, I'm showing my age here when I talk about these sorts of things. And, yeah, and it was, yeah, and it was great. And that kind of shifted me in, into wanting to do bodybuilding and stuff like that. Now. That's the, the general story I tell people in terms of what got me into training. But I'm also going to share a bit more of the story I don't share too often with people, unless they come into our course and we kind of sit down and, you know, I like to, to lead from the front by being vulnerable because I ask people to be vulnerable with me, you know, to really um, get the most out of the program. So the real story that I share with people is all that stuff was true, but there was, there was sort of a shadow side behind that that I don't really talk about too much. And that was, you know, being raised in a very aggressive, very violent sort of upbringing. 
And I used to get beaten a lot. So my dad had a lot of anger issues and stuff. And in his way of thinking, you know, the best way to raise a son to become a man is to use a lot of force, a lot of physical force and things like that. So my whole sort of adolescent years, I was very intimidated, very afraid, getting beaten up all the time. And it was really that that got me to the gym with this idea of I need to get big. I need to, you know, stop being, you know, the bullied and start being the bully. So that was really what really motivated me. And you, know, you touched upon steroids. And, you know, I'm, I'm very upfront about that. I didn't do a lot of steroids, but I did dabble with steroids because it was like fear that got me into the fitness industry. And, you know, all I cared about was getting as freaking big as possible right, to protect myself, to, to stop being beaten up, stop being you know, bullied all the time. So when someone first introduced me to this idea of taking anabolic steroids, I was like, what's that going to do? You know, I kind of was, I was aware of it, but I didn't really know anything about it at the time. And they just said the magic words to me at the time, which was, we'll get you freaking big really fast. And I'm like, okay, cool, where do I stick the needle? Because that was all that I was caring about at the time. You know, it wasn't about health, it wasn't about anything other than I just want to get freaking as big as possible so I stop getting bullied all the time. So I did a few cycles of that and you know, I blew up really big, really quick. So that was kind of a, an interesting point. And um, to kind of expand upon that, like really what sort of, you know, you mentioned Paul Check and things like that. Well, it was around that time that I, I first came across the, the teachings of Paul Check, And I was reading a, a fitness magazine at the time and you know, looking through it. And, you know, I believe in fate. I think that, you know, we're meant to meet the people that we're meant to have experiences with. And, you know, the world always, creates the opportunities to move us forward and you know not just to go through life but to grow through life so I keep coming across this name Paul Check, and I thought oh, I've got to check it out so I rang up a trainer once he did one of his courses and said look what, what's the deal here is it worth doing you know what, what's your take and he just said man it was one of the best courses I've ever done so if you get the chance to do it go go check it out and so I looked into it and sure enough Paul was coming back to New Zealand that year so I registered to do one of his courses I think it was um I think the first course I did was scientific core training um, and then scientific back training was the, these, these modules. So got in the car, drove, drove up to Christchurch from Dunedin, which is like about a four and a half hour drive and went into this course and sat there. And within an hour, I just was like, whoa. Like, you know, this is, to put into uh, perspective, I did a four year degree, okay? And I was very used to how lecture is presented. It was like, Okay, this is anatomy, and they just talk about anatomy. And this is biomechanics, and they just talk about biomechanics. What was your degree in, Mark? Uh, a Bachelor in Physical Education. Okay. So, yeah. So, you know, and then I listened to this guy, Paul Check talk, and it was just phenomenal. It was just like he just kept crossing into all these different lanes all the time, and it didn't matter what you asked him. He, he had a way of connecting with it, explaining it, unpacking it, and then giving you answers, and he could back everything up. Like his mind was like a computer. He could talk about research and studies, and, and I was just in awe. So after the, the, the first two days of, of studying with him, I remember at the end of the course, I just, when we finished, I just went up to him and I just said, I said, Paul, I want to do what you do. I said, you know, what, what will it take? And he just, he sort of laughed. And because you know, back then, I was, he, he could tell I was not a typical healthy, holistic type person. In fact, I didn't even know what the word holistic meant back then. I was still like, you know, thinking about getting big and, and all that sort of stuff. I don't think stuff. it really existed back then. Was, did yeah. it exist? Maybe it didn't exist. Uh, it, it did in the sort of the tree hugging community. <laughs> so there's a lot of people that I, I knew that did like Reiki and, and things like that. They would talk about holistic approach, but I never really, you know, I unfortunately back then I was very limited in my thinking. I was very much into my intellect. If it wasn't backed by science, it, it was pseudoscience. It wasn't worth knowing and things like that. So he was the first sort of real like intellect academic I met that was using these sorts of words. And uh, he just looked at me and he just said, Mark, he goes, I'll tell you what, he goes, I'm, I'm coming back. I'm doing a, a course on, it was his level one certification type program. And he goes, come and do that. And I think it was in about three weeks time or something. And he goes, and if you do well there and apply yourself and, and put in the work and I can see that you, you know, you've got what it takes to be a presenter, he goes, I'll, I'll give you a job lecturing for me. So that was all that I needed to know. I had this, I had this focus now. And it was quite funny because in the Czech program, I, I got, got nicknamed the, the black sheep because I did everything against the, the, the Czech approach. So as much as I loved it, I was like a little kid. And, you know, we talk about in, you know, psychology and that, you know, people having either a compliant or defiant relationship with, with people and, and things like that. And as much as I loved Paul and his teachings, I, I also had a very defiant relationship with his teachings as well. 
in terms of this holistic sort of model of understanding. So I was always kind of pushing the boundaries and you know, to put it into context, when I went up into that level one with him, that, that first course that he said, you know, you come and do this. And if you do well, mm. you know, I'll open some doors for you. It was an interesting experience. It was like about eight days, if I remember correctly. And it was towards the end, but I was staying with some friends and they, they took me out that night. And, you know, it's like when you're younger, you're in your twenties and stuff and you go out drinking and next thing you know, you come out of the clubs and it's like daylight. You go, oh no. And I had to go straight to the, to the, you know, the presentation with Paul. So they just pretty much put me in a car and dropped me off there. So I walked in wearing the clothes that I was wearing out. I, I stunk of smoke, stunk of alcohol, because back then you could smoke in the clubs. And, you know, you, you go into a club, you come out, you smell like a, a brewery <laughs> sort of thing. And I walked in and Paul was assessing someone. And I had to sit down like that and my eyes were bloodshot and I was like, you know, falling asleep. And when he finished the assessment, he just, he got me up in front of the class, sat me down in the chair and he just went off at me. Like just, yeah, he pretty much disciplined me in, in front of the whole class and said that I'm a waste of life. I'm this, I'm that. I'm never going to amount to anything. I have no respect for anyone. And gave me this big freaking lecture in front of everyone. And he goes, you got anything to say for yourself? And I went, oh, one thing. And he goes, what's that? And I said, you still going to give me a lecturing job if I apply myself? He goes, get out of here. <laughs> so I had to leave. But then he let me come back in again. And we had a bit of a chat. And, and that was the start of our very rocky but beautiful relationship. <laughs> I'll just yeah. leave it alone. Yeah. But he, he's, um, he's a great guy. He's, he's been one of the, the, the biggest influences in my life. Like I said before, I kind of came into the industry, you know, in the low road, doing it for the wrong reasons. And Paul was the first sort of real mentor, like, like he was more than just a teacher. He was like a friend. He was like a, a mentor, you know, all those sorts of labels applied to the relationship I had with him. And he, he really helped me see where I was kind of going in life if I didn't course correct. And he did a, a wonderful job at kind of opening all these opportunities for me if I stepped in, you know, and, and did the work to take those opportunities. So mm -hmm. like, I'll always be grateful for that. And I was so blessed to have him as my, my first real teacher outside of university because he helped me kind of break free of this whole, you know, getting locked into academia, thinking academia has, has all the answers. And what he taught me was a way of, of looking at things outside of our traditional education, which is this holistic model, that, that word holism, you know, the holistic approach, and kind of understanding that, you know, people are not just um, a mechanical system. There is a system of systems there, you know, the physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual. And I'll be honest, it was like, I love the physical to start with. I, I kind of got a little bit freaked out by the, the mental, emotional, and I wanted to run a mile from the spiritual. So when I first started my, my journey with Paul, you know, he was very much into orthopedic rehab and strength and conditioning. And I loved all that. It got me really excited. And then he kind of started to shift. So a few years into it, when I was lecturing for him, he started to shift more into the mental, emotional, and spiritual aspects of his teaching. And I was in San Diego one time and we went to a cafe, we were having lunch, and he started to try to get me ready to start teaching more of the holistic stuff. And, but he knew I was going to struggle with it. And he spent we had a two hour conversation explaining to me how something like even a rock has consciousness. And it just confused the, the frick out of me. I'm like, and I just remember saying to him, like, like, Paul, look, I, I love you and I'll, I'll always listen to you. But the day that you get up on stage with a tambourine is the day that I'm going to have to walk out of that room, you know? And we just laughed about it and we, we sort of carried on. And, you know, fast forward, I think maybe five years and we're in the UK <laughs> and we went out to Beachy Heads, which is this beautiful, like a spiritual area, but it's a, you know, a lot of people go there. And, he just said to me, we're going to do a workout. And I said, oh, what do I bring? What gear? And he goes, no, just, just come. And I go, that's weird. You know, how are we going to train? With, like, what are we meant to wear? And it was him, Matt Walden, who's another, another phenomenal mind. Um, and we're up at Beachy Heads. Next thing you know, he's getting out, like, Tibetan bowls and tuning forks and all this. And he's, like, you know, clanging and then going, bing, bing. And I just go, oh, God, it's the tambourine. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah. But, and that's one thing I, I love about Paul because he really – I respected him so much. He was one of the few people that could really challenge me like that without me just bailing on them and going, nah, you're an idiot, we're done, sort of thing. So, yeah, as hard as it was, I was very fortunate to have him, you know, as a, as a big influence in my life because he really challenged me and he really is a, a big reason that I ended up becoming who I am today and how FMA 
really became you know, conceived and, and became what it is today. So this is a very quick intro for you. Interesting. And for those that don't know who Paul Check is, and that I just have so many questions now after that too, for those that don't know who Paul Check is, how would you explain who he is in relation to the fitness industry? I'm constantly, I shouldn't be as surprised, but I'm often surprised when a trainer that's come into the industry in the last 10 years, say, doesn't know who he is, which is a shame because yeah. I would say he's responsible for bringing those into the industry. That's a pitfall. What would you say? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the people that kind of have an, a, a, a small awareness of him would, would, would say, yeah, he's the Swiss ball guy. So he was known, known for that for a while, but that, that's not who Paul is. Right? That was just a tool that uh, he introduced in the fitness industry back in like the 90s, if I remember correctly. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it, it, it took off back, back then. So, yeah, that's why he kind of was like the Swiss ball guy. But he, he's so much more than that. Like, he's, he's an innovator. That, that's how I describe him. Like, he just... I've never met anyone in my life who is so committed to becoming the best presenter, the best coach, the best healer, whatever label he wanted to use, right? He goes all in and he's, mm. he's committed. So, you know, I remember when I was staying with him, I spent a week staying with him in, in San Diego. And I've never, I, I thought I was a hard worker, you know, and studied and stuff, but man, no, nah, not compared to what Paul Check was like. Like he'd get up in the morning and he'd do his training or whatever, but his whole day was around learning. So when he's having breakfast, he has a, a reading stand beside his t- the table. So while he's eating, he's, he's reading, he's studying. You know, and he'll say to you, he goes, look, 10 minute chat, and then I'm zoning out, I'm doing my thing, I've got to read, I've got to do some, I'm doing some work. And then he goes away and he's working, and he goes to the, the restaurant for lunch and he's, he's working, like reading and stuff. He always takes a big stack of books with him. I asked him to go to the movie, him and his wife, one night. We went to the movie. And I couldn't believe it. While we were waiting in the line to get the tickets, he's reading a book, right? Then we get the tickets and then we go into the movie and we sit down and he's reading like this, you know? And then the light goes off while there's just, you know, getting ready and then a little pen light comes out and he's still reading. And then the moment the movie started, he closed the book and he watched the movie. (laughs) It was like, so he's just, he's such an incredible intellect. He's such a innovator. Um, he's always my experience of him, and all I can share is my experience. But he's always just way ahead of the game, like way ahead of the game. Like things that he was teaching me and talking about, you know, back in the early two thousands, people are still talking about it now. Like it, it's 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 new, it's innovative. Yeah. It's like yeah. no, nah. like he was always way ahead of the game, and that's often why a lot of people got intimidated by him and sort of labelled him, you know, in, in negative in a negative light because some of the stuff was so far out there. It was just going to take a long time for science to catch up. And, and some of the things you would talk about, right, science probably will never catch up because, you know, there's just some things that, that we can't sort of, we can't sort of measure. It's, quite, it's like a, a knowing without knowing how we know sort of thing. And that's where, what made him so powerful. He was that combination of, of intellect, but also intuition in terms of what he did as well. He guided a lot of them. You're right. I, I never, no one has ever lived up to, I heard him first at a Phylex breakfast in 1998, the mm-hmm. fitness convention in Sydney, 98, 99 maybe. And after that, doing the course, the same core conditioning via mm-hmm. the videos. I've never heard anybody speak and then reference everything like he's a dictionary, like he's, a, he's actually a walking encyclopedia. No mm-hmm. other lecturer has um, stepped up to that level apart from obviously you, his protege, of course. Can you, can you elaborate on the, some of the other big names? Like obviously the most controversial one on the other side of the coin to him from an outsider perspective, it looked like was Poliquin. Right, yeah. Um, now, I, I, I don't know what the insides were. I heard they were friends, they weren't friends, they were friends, they weren't friends. Um, I've been trained in both now and I don't like to label myself as either modality. I like to just be Kate and use whatever comes out. I think everything's got its place. What Mm -hmm. I loved about Paul was he never put anybody else down ever, not publicly anyway. Um, Whereas I couldn't say the same for the other side either. But is there any insider goss that you know about the relationship? No, not really insider goss. It was just... You know, again, I can just share my experience, but you know, they they were friends and they 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 did a lot together back in the the early days. 
Mm. And of course, you know, they, they, they both have very, I guess, strong opinions and ego, <laughs> if you want to use that word, mm. and which they kind of split and kind of went off in different directions. And, you know, for some reason, Paul was at the time, he wanted to set up his institute and, and, and go down that path. And, and from what I remember, Paul was more the big name, like, you know, you had to pay a lot of money to work with him and get coached by him. And then shortly after, you know, the institute has been going for quite a while now, we, we kind of heard rumors that, that Paul Lukin was going to start, you know, the Paul Lukin Institute and, and kind of start competing against Paul. And I remember hearing that going, okay, well, Paul, we better, you know, like get ready for this because it, it, there's probably going to be a lot of drama that's going to be created with, with this happening as well. And, and sure enough, it, it kicked off and instantly the industry kind of become very polarized. You know, you were either a Czechie or a, a Polokan. Um, even to the point, like in big gyms, like both, both did very well, for example, in Australia. So I remember like Paul was, was big in New Zealand and Australia, sort of more so before the US. Like for some reason, this side of the world was just really leaning into, you know, spending money to get educated and, and all this sort of stuff. So he really had a foothold, you know, in Australasia sort of thing. And then Paul can sort of started penetrating the market as well. And he got a good foothold because the guy's phenomenal too. Like he, he, he was a very brilliant man, but they kind of appealed to two different types of markets in, in a sense. So that kind of created that, that separation. So you go into a gym like fitness first, which is, was back, especially you know, the early 2000s was like, you know, a big franchise all through Australia and stuff it was rapidly growing in that. And there was so much just conflict within, within the gym between the trainers. You know, between the Czechs versus the Polk and, and things like that. So it was interesting because when I set up FMA, I first launched FMA in around 2009. And the idea, like FMA was all about bridging the gap between musculoskeletal rehab and strength and conditioning. And it was kind of to, to bridge the gap as well between Czech and Polk. So it was really good. It was kind of like the first course that brought both into the classroom together. And I'll never forget the, the first course I taught back in 2009. I walked in and someone said, man, this is going to be interesting. I go, why? And he goes, there's about 10 Polican people down there. There's a whole lot of Czechies as well. And I walk into the room and it was just like, it was so funny. Like all the Polican was sitting over that side. The Czechies were on the side of the room, you know, and they weren't, they weren't talking. They weren't even looking at each other. And then when I started talking, one of the Czechies thought, well, because I'm a Czechie as well, um, just went straight into, hey, Mark, do you want us to talk about how stupid the clat test is and all, all the limitations in the clat test? And they just naturally assumed because I was a cheeky, I was going to side with them and we we're going to gang up on, on the whole of it. And I just remember I had to set the tone for the, for the course. I said, look, I said, we're not doing that. I said, because if you want to start picking holes in what Paul, like what you see Paul can does, right? There's stuff that these guys know way more about than you. And if they start picking holes in you, you're going to look stupid as well. So is that how you want to spend this? Or do you want to come together and, and learn together and start sharing information? And I had to set that tone. And by the end of the course, there was a new sort of found respect for each other. It was, it was really cool to see. And that was kind of what we kept doing. We kept trying to, you know, bring these two worlds together. But even then, it was still, there was always the extremes as well that just wouldn't even, you know, have anything to do with the FMA because it had an attachment to pole, uh, to, you know, to check and stuff. And it just, it just carried on. It was, it, was, it was fascinating to the point where a lot of the PTMs were just going, this has got to stop. This is crazy. <laughs> so if you're not familiar with Fitness First, you're talking about the personal training managers. Um, mm. Yeah, that's that, that's the world I remember. That that's still what it feels like to me because that's my association of back in the day. Yeah. Um, it's funny I with the with being trained trained in the Czech stuff too. I physically kind of left the room, not so to speak, but stopped doing the courses when he started talking about Tai Chi and energy zones and all the rest of it. But ironically, now I think it's the forties, or I've noticed you know how you get into the upper chakras or whatever it is. Then around the forties, forty two. Um, I've totally come full circle and love my meditation now. Can we go back to um, talking about Paul, not necessarily that, but just talking about the delivery of, I guess, knowledge from, from research and science to the foundations of how, how quickly it actually gets into the knowledge that's delivered in a university versus, uh, versus other forms of trying out uh, for example, pharmaceutical drugs on vets on, and animals and how, that, how the journey of knowledge happens. I never forget Paul saying once how 
before a doctor can prescribe the medication and before all the tests have been done now i'm going to butcher this so you medical people with degrees please forgive me but that knowledge seems to be you know obviously it's disregarded first then it might be tested on vets i mean farmers sorry use it on their animals bodybuilders mm. use it on themselves then universities decide to do five to ten years worth of testing then pharmaceutical companies will be able to prescribe the thing can yeah. you expand on can you say that properly for me yeah okay look i when i when i did my my degree i remember one of the, the first things a presenter said to me was he goes okay so here's the deal he goes over the next 12 months i'm going to teach you everything i know on this this topic but the problem is, is that when we fast forward, say maybe 10 years from now, right, over 50% of it will be redundant or proven to be wrong. And he goes, but I don't know what the 50% I'm going to teach you is a lot of crap, so I've just got to teach you everything anyway. Wow. And he was trying to get the message across saying, so always keep learning. This was just the start of your journey. Don't think just because you've got a degree that you now know everything about this topic, because he goes, because half of what you think you know is going to be proven wrong anyway in the next 10 years. So keep being a student, keep learning. And I, and I love that he kind of, shared that and it's been true and then you know i was doing sports psychology as, as part of my degree as well and one of the presenters there said that um what what we have in textbooks now again is always about 10 years behind the curve because before they can like formally introduce something you know at a tertiary level sort of thing um it has to sort of stand the test of time it, it's got to be used enough it's got to be proven enough it's got to be you know rigorously sort of tested and stuff that they go okay it is now kind of safe to, to make this part of the, the core curriculum and, and things like that so they're very reluctant to update things you know and i remember it was really frustrating because all this cool stuff going on in the world but we're still learning very basic sort of things like that so that's kind of yeah the challenge now and this is why we kind of say a lot of people will often agree with this like you, you get your degree right just to get something up on the wall but then once you leave this is when the real learning really starts you you know, because you start to open yourself up to what's really happening right now. And a lot of people like myself, you know, as soon as I left my degree, you know, I kind of said, well, look, you know, if you want to be the best, you, you got to learn from the best. So what I started to do then was realize that a lot of people that were teaching me stuff at, at the university level were with the academics. Like they have a lot of knowledge, but they have no real experience in, in a lot of this stuff. Mm -hmm. And I always have a saying that I heard a while back, which is, you know, knowledge and knowing must come together to have wisdom. So knowledge is, you know, understanding information, but knowing is when you have experience with that information. And that's what leads to having wisdom on something. So I was always wanting to go, okay, well, who are the people actually in the trenches getting results? I want to learn from them. And that's what led me to like, you know, discovering like Paul Check, but also another big influence I talk a lot about was, was Louis Simmons from Westside Barber. And I was fortunate enough to, to go to Columbus, Ohio and spend a week with him and then have like an ongoing relationship with him off the back of that. Incredible guy, so many stories I could tell you about him, but you know, just to put it into perspective, you know, when I flew over there to see him, in my arrogance, I was kind of thinking, oh, what am I gonna learn from a powerlifting coach? Because he was at then, he was predominantly known for, for powerlifting. And let's just say that the week that I spent there, it kind of um, pretty much deconstructed and then had forced me to reconstruct everything I thought I knew about strength and conditioning. You know, and when I left there, I said to Louis, any advice? And he said, yeah, he said, he said it's time to put down the, the books and start picking up the weights. You're too weak, <laughs> like that. I was too much of an academic. And, you know, I've got to say, compared to what these freaking guys were doing, I, I felt like what I was doing in the gym was just like picking up peak dumbbells. I mean, even the girls there were squatting more, pulling more, benching more than what I could. It was, it was, it was a hard pull to take at the time. But yeah, so... And that's when I, I really learned, and I kind of learned two things. <laughs> One is, is that we don't need to reinvent the wheel because a lot of the information is already out there. You just got to study, you know, from the great minds of, of yesteryear, and you'll see that they've already, they've already done a lot of this stuff. They've already innovated and pioneered a lot of stuff that we need to know. And the other thing is, is that, yeah, learn from the people that are doing it because, you know, there's, there's only so much you can learn in, in textbooks and informal courses versus hanging around the people that, that are getting results. And one of the things that Louis said that, that really freaked my head, freaked my mind at the time, and you'll know this, Kate, like you go to, to a gym and you got your PTs there and they put their little things up on their board, you know, advertising themselves and they'll say things like, 
you know, I'm a specialist in weight loss. I'm a specialist in postnatal rehab. I'm a specialist in performance. Like, they're all specialists in, in these different sorts of things. I specialize these different things. And then I was talking to Louis, who's, you know, at the time he was in his 50s. And he'd been doing this since he was about 14, if I remember correctly, like dedicating his life to lifting. And I'm watching him. And I, he, he reminded me of Paul in the sense he could just look at someone and know what they needed to do. Paul was the only other person I could see doing that. Um, when you could do that. And I remember Louis saying to me one day, he goes, he goes, yeah, he goes, I'm, he goes, I've been studying this and working with athletes in this area now for like 40 odd years, whatever it was. And he goes, I reckon that I know possibly about 80% of everything I need to know about powerlifting and, and getting people strong in the sport. And I'm like, what? Because in my world, you know, I, I did PTing and we were all specialists. You know, we would all say, I specialize in this, I specialize in that. And it was like, wow. And that gave me just a, a deep respect, you know, for for what, what I now refer to as, as developing the coach's eye, right? So it's not about having book smart, it's about having coach, the coach's eye. It's about, you know, you can only help people with what you can see, right? And really tuning that in. So yeah, he was a, another big influence and he introduced me to so much understanding of, like I said, Paul was more about all the science and the references, you know, like now, which is really, and, and, I mean, I'm not mean to do him um, an injustice because he studied a lot of the old stuff as well. It's freaking phenomenal. But, you know, I just kind of knew him for being able to reference everything, the physiotherapist yonder, you know, and blah, 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 and all that sort of stuff. But Louis kind of told me to draw the wisdom from the, the experts of yesteryear. And he introduced me to all the, all the research and the work that came out of the Soviets and, and things like that. What are some names that, that people could research if they want to get into this? Well, for strength and conditioning. Yeah. Yeah, I think that the best start is getting into the work by Zatskiorski, like Vladimir Zatskiorski. So that's that's pretty much where I started. And he, he's the one that kind of gets into understanding strength development and understanding that you know, strength is dependent upon like this sort of three key areas or three ways to develop strength, like the max effort method, the dynamic effort method, and the repeated effort method. And he, he's got a good book. I think it's called um, The Science and Practice of Strength Training or Strength Development. So that, that's a really good book. It's a good combination of sort of theory, but, but practicality. Have you so, got a book? Have I also? Have you got a book? Have I got a book? Hmm. How do you mean, have I got a book? Have you written a book? Because we should oh, be I've reading written. Mark's book. No, I, I haven't written a book. I, I'm more of a speaker. Me too. I like to talk. Yeah. yeah. But one day I should get things to be transcribed. Yeah, one day. That's... Amazing. Any other interesting lessons that you learn off Louis Simmons? I was going to ask, did you have any other mentors apart from Paul Check? Of course you did. And of course you've always followed the greats around and probably always had a coach yourself as well. I'm astounded that people don't do that. Yeah. Um, we, we, we could do like a, a whole week podcast just talking about my experience with Louis Simmons. The guy's phenomenal. And we could do the same for Paul another week there. Just talking I'm, about it's it's exciting that what you heard from your university lecturer was that in a few years you won't this won't be relevant um mm. i don't remember hearing in many other people if any saying that that was their experience at university maybe they didn't hear the lecturer say that or they just didn't it didn't absorb for them interesting yeah. um in relation to all the knowledge that you know now and you're lecturing in some some big box gyms, meaning, you know, the larger franchise gyms for anyone that's listening. And mm -hmm. so you're coming across newer trainers, would you say at the moment, or a lot of yeah. newer yeah. trainers? It's still a good, it's still a good mix, but we are starting in front of a lot more newer trainers as well now. Yeah. Yeah. So from the perspective of, of someone that's in the first few years of their career, would you say, what are mm -hmm. some things that they should know and should do? Aside from spending time with clients, I totally agree that rather than books, it's, it's clients and the awareness of the body and mm -hmm. time under tension yeah. with the clients. What should they do to be a success from a technical perspective? And then let's go into the other part. What's the other part? Well, from a technical perspective, what are some things that they should know to be good? Yeah. Like from an assessment of the body perspective, from a getting results with the clients physically. Yeah. I'll probably just do one step before that yep. um, because, you know, I kind of, I shared my story at the start about what got me into the fitness industry, like how I ended up there. 
And we always start our courses with a conversation around that. So when we get these new PTs come in, I'm always curious as to how do they end up here? Like what, what's their backstory? What got them into personal training? Because, you know, there's a lot of truth to the saying that our wounds become our work. And a lot of people come into the fitness industry, just like myself, through that low road approach. All right. So one of the things that I've noticed over the years, and it's getting worse and worse and worse, is that unfortunately, to a large degree, the fitness industry is an industry now of very unhealthy relationships with body image and disordered eating. Yeah. And we see it a lot. And we're seeing it more and more in the coaches and the, and the trainers that are coming into the industry because their wounds is kind of what, what got them in there. So, okay. yeah, so we're, we're very big now on, on connecting with, you know, what it means to be a coach because before we take on the role and responsibility of coaching others, we need to take on the responsibility of coaching ourselves. So that's why I share my story and get vulnerable with people. And it's amazing how many people break down, get emotional, go, oh my God, that, that's like my story or, you know, I'm, I'm suffering here and I, you know, blah, blah, blah. And they realize that they're not sharing wisdom with their clients, they're sharing their wounds with their clients. You know, so we always start at, at that level. Now, once, once we've gone very deep into that and we, we start helping people, you know, coaching themselves out, because we talk about what it means to be a leader, because when people come to work with you, right, they're looking for a leader. That's really what it comes down to. And we can also replace the word leadership or leader with role model. So I often ask that like, when it comes to health, what type of role model are you being to your clients? And it's no wonder why so many PTs today suffer from imposter syndrome or feel like they're hypocrites because, you know, when you really look at how they lead themselves in life and how they show up for themselves, it's just not there, right? They're suffering just like everyone else. And they're struggling to, to put these health practices in place and, you know, and, and, and show up and be the person they want to be. So we kind of really connect with that because we say leadership is about, you know, leading from the front. It's not like being a travel agent where you point people in a direction to go that you've never gone yourself. That's a great right? analogy. Yeah, Guys, and- actually, a great interview is to listen to Mark interview Himmy, his wife, on the food entry to the, the food and the diet and the pain. That interview was great. Sorry to interrupt. Yeah. And, you know, so we, we get very clear on, on what type of role model we need to be in, in leadership and all that. Now, let's say that once we've done that, so now they're, they're ready to take on the role and responsibility of coaching others. So they're ready now to start sharing wisdom, not sharing their wounds with their clients. All right. Then it's kind of, a, okay, well, then how do we get good at this job? Because, you know, we talk a lot about business, and, you know, because it is a business that we're in. And we kind of break PTing down to two key areas. One is, you gotta be very good at, at delivering value, right? You gotta be good at something. You gotta be able to deliver results. And then the next thing is you gotta be good at communicating value. So these two things have to go hand in hand. So, you know, I, I give the example of, you know, I've seen many times where you've got two trainers that have exactly the same sort of, you know, skill set and they can deliver the same result, yet one of them's crushing it and, and selling big packages and making a lot of money. Another one's struggling to get by selling sessions. And it's not because there's a gap in terms of how well they can deliver results because they can both deliver. It's just how well they communicate. Value is completely different. So sales is, is, is a big thing. So I always say, first, you've got to get good at something, but you've got to be good at your job. That's the first thing. And then when you're good at what you do, right, then you've got to get good at communicating your value to people. right? And that's where we see more and more PTs struggling with. So this is why we kind of enjoy getting in front of, you know, the, the new PT straight out of the gate, you know, straight out of Cert 3, Cert 4, because they kind of come out going, well, I'm really underprepared to build a business, you know, with the qualification that I've got. So they're more of like, a, like an open book to say, just show me what to do and, and I'll run that play. And it, it's really exciting to see. So, yeah, it's get good at something and then, and whatever your passion is, you know, we, we often talk about, like I said before, so I can go into a bit more detail, but you know, your wounds often become your work. So when we look at what's called the three Ps, which is your passion, your purpose, and your profit, and, and you would have seen this a lot. You know, you might talk to someone and go, what, what, what's your passion? What, what's, what is it you want to do? What's the gifts that you want to share with the world? How do you want to have an impact? And a lot of PTs can talk about that because quite often, you know, they talk a bit about their backstory and the struggle they went through. And some of them even have a story about how a PT um, got them out of that of a, a really dark place and they want to go on and kind of help other people like that but we will have this a lot of us have a story if we didn't get into PTing just just for money you know I want to make money doing PTing sort of thing and then you go cool so we connect with that and then we go okay well 
then we talk, go from passion to purpose. So how do you want to make a difference? Well, okay, it's with PTing and it's working with this target audience and, and blah, blah, blah. But then it's funny because you go, okay, so let's go down to profit. How do you want to make money doing that? They're like, huh? Well, how, how do you want to make money? Huh? <laughs> and they, they bottleneck there. And then they'll, and how many times have you had this? They'll try to give you some sort of story around, oh, well, I'm not in it for the money. I just want to help people. Right. Yeah. How, how many wounded healers and rescuers do we see coming into this industry? You know, a lot. And it's, it's beautiful because they're in it for the right reason. Like they really want to help people. And they always have that story around, well, I want to put people above profit. You know, I don't want to be someone that puts profit above people. I go, yeah, that's cool. But, you know, great work deserves to be paid greatly. So why not make it about people and profit? Why does it have to be one or the other? You know, so... I think that's, that's the big skill that a lot of people need to learn is how to sell. And why do people struggle? It's because, you know, it's, it's fairly easy to sell a product that's outside of you. You know, like it's easy to go, hey, look, I'm a car salesman. I'm going to sell this car. Now, it's funny because what does someone do when they want to buy a car? If you, if you come into the car yard and you want to buy a car off me, you're going to go, I want to get it for the best price that I can. So you're going to go in there trying to devalue the car to get a better price. So you're gonna go, oh yeah, the upholstery is not quite up to scratch. I don't quite like the color and the stereo needs to be replaced, da, 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 da. And you're gonna start trying to pick all the things that are wrong to try to lower the value to get it for a better price, right? But the car salesman doesn't take that personally because you're just devaluing a car. It's just selling a product, right? But when you get into service like personal training, now you're kind of selling yourself because you are the service. So when people start, Mm, that's a bit expensive or oh, I don't know, right? PTs take it personally, right? They think they feel like they're being devalued and they don't know how to deal with that. So yeah, it's, it's really interesting how we see this play out over and over again. How many people want to get into being personal trainers, but they, they want to try and build a career without having to sell. They want to avoid selling. And there's all these horrible feelings that come up with selling, you know, like, oh, I don't want to be sleazy and slimy and salesy. And because we all had these bad experiences of, of salespeople. You know, we love to buy, but we hate being sold to. You know, so we kind of project that onto other people going, oh, now I'm trying to sell them. And they're not going to like that. And they're not going to like me. And then they're going to say no. And then all these fears about rejection are going to come up and blah, blah, blah. And we see it over and over again. So get good. I'll stop talking there. I'll go on for ages. No, that. please don't. It's, I didn't think that you were going to go down this track at all, but it's, but it's, it's the actual point. I mean, apart from, yes, get good. Yeah. Yeah, so get good at delivering value. And my advice is, you know, do what you love with the people that you love, right? So don't think that you've got to have all the answers in the first year of PTN. Like the, we kind of refer to that, you know, your first sort of one to two years is your general space. It's you're, you're just kind of finding out what you're good at and you're sharpening your saw and skill set. You're getting good at getting better at things and stuff like that. And then you'll start to identify what it is that you really love doing. So for me, you know, I started off, um, you know, doing just general bodybuilding type training. And then I got in with Paul and I started getting right into rehab and I worked at the hospital for a few years doing rehab. But then I kind of went, no, nah, that's not my thing. You know, I want something more. I love working with athletes. Then I, I left the hospital and I went and I started working more with athletes and rugby players and MMA fighters. And I loved all that. But something was missing there. And then I kind of realized, hey, this is my thing. I can be that person that can bridge the gap between rehab and SNC because so many of the athletes I was working with um, were getting injured. And then they'll go to like Allied Health and Allied Health was very good at doing the acute stuff and maybe getting them back to their pre-injury state. But what happens then? And when we have these conversations with Allied Health, they didn't really understand, you know, what was involved in SNC. And the SNC coaches didn't really understand what was too much involved with, with rehab. So it was just this gray area in the middle that no one was really steering the ship very well. And that was where I plugged myself in and go, that's the space that I want to own. That's how I want to stand out and be seen as an authority. And I always share with the students a story I loved when I was younger. It was, it was about the Boilermaker. And it's a story about knowing where to tap. And I've always carried this with me. It's kind of like the story goes that there was a steamship that, that broke down and they, they, they just could not get it started. So they eventually go, look, there's an old retired boiler maker up on the hill. Let's bring him down and see if he can help. So they bring him in. He goes down into the boiler room. He's listening to all the sounds. So they try to start it up. And after about 10 minutes, he pulls out a little hammer from his bag, walks over to a red valve, listens again, and then cracks the valve with the hammer. Steam comes out and everything starts up and it's going. 
And they were like, wow, that's amazing. You know, thank you, thank you. you know, you've, you've saved us a lot of money. And the captain goes, how much do we owe you for that? And he goes, that would be $1,000. And the captain's like, the frick, you mean $1,000? You're only here for like 10 minutes. How could it be $1,000? And he goes, for tapping the valve with the hammer, 50 cents. For knowing where to tap with the hammer, $995.50. Or well, no, sorry, $999.50. And, and it was like, wow, well, that, that's the truth there. It's, you get paid for knowing where to tap. That's where the value is. And, and that's what we do. It's like when we work with people, our job is to solve problems. And this is why we always say to our students, like, don't sell products, sell solutions to the problems that your clients are having because money follows value. That's value. And if you want to make a lot of money and be successful, then you have to offer more value than your competition. So get good at adding value. And how do you add value? Because you get good at solving problems. And how do you get good at solving problems? You get good at recognizing what the problems are, what people really need versus what they often tell you they need. So that's a, that's a, that's a big thing. And we can keep talking about business if you want, I enjoy it. Yeah, I've noticed, it's good. Well then, what do you think in regards to more experienced trainers as in how can they get good, better, be the best? Um, well, that's interesting. Uh, like when you, when you look at the experienced trainers today, right? they tend to be what we refer to as running a win-lose model. So they, they get into personal training and they, they tend to, you know, here's a typical story, right? You get out of your cert three, your cert four, you go to a gym, right? You're told to do one-on-one -on -one and get busy. But that's a typical story for most people. And if you're lucky enough to survive the first couple of years and come out the other side, you know, as a successful PT, right? Well then, what have you really built for yourself? Well, you probably, if you're being honest, you haven't really built yourself a business. You've built yourself busyness. There's a huge difference. Business is something that serves you. Busyness is something that you have to serve, right? So what we mean by a win-lose model is that these PTs who are successful, right, they're cashed up, but they're time poor. And we see this over and over again. They're doing long hours. They're doing often doing like split shifts and things like that. And we start to see the same thing play out. And that is, you know, anything outside of work takes a hit, right? Their relationships take a hit, their training takes a hit, their health takes a hit. And, you know, when you're young, you're kind of more resilient. You can kind of get away with that because you're enjoying, but I'm making lots of money. You know, I'm, I'm going to the bank. And, you know, from the outside looking in, you are successful. You're the busy PT, which everyone strives to. But eventually that catches up on you. And you start to realize that that approach to business is not sustainable and it's not scalable. And then eventually it catches up and you start to realize, holy shit, right? I, I don't want to keep doing this the way that I'm doing it. But now we have this huge amount of stress because it's like, okay, well, we've kind of got used to a certain sort of lifestyle financially. You know, how would I change that without losing clients, without losing money? So we tended to have a lot of those conversations with the, the busy PT, you know, the ones that are kind of going, wow, th this is not really going to be my end game because I can't keep this up forever. It, it's really starting to exhaust me. And um, it's, it's interesting, the conversations we've had, you know, I mean, we had one lady come into the course and she was a busy PT, but she hadn't really experienced the consequence of that busyness yet. So for her, it was kind of like, well, it ain't broke. So we often try to say, okay, well, let's, let's impart wisdom. What can we learn from the PTs that have been running that play for a long time, right? What's the lessons there that maybe, you know, you can, that speak to you that you can connect with. And it, nothing was kind of landing because she was kind of going, yeah, but I'm, you know, I'm making like two to $3,000 a week. You know, I'm happy and things like that. I enjoy working. So in the class, I kind of said to her, okay, well, that's cool. You, you are successful. And she goes, yeah, I am successful. And she said, you are, that, that's great. I said, but is there a different way that we could look at success? And she goes, what do you mean? I said, well, what are some other ways that you could be successful? And she didn't quite know what I meant. And I said, well, let me ask you this. You're making say 3,000 a week. And she goes, yeah. I said, how many hours a week are you working? And she was doing about 50 hours a week, you know, on the floor and stuff like that, doing split shifts and that. I went, okay, well, financially, $3,000, you're doing very well. And I said, but would you consider it more successful if you were making, say, the same two to $3,000 a week, but say maybe now working, say, 25 hours a week, half the time? Because one of the things that we, we like to teach our students is that a question I always ask straight out of the gate once we kind of know what come into the, pro, you know, the training program, or like what got into PT and all that deeper stuff, is I'll often ask them, you know, what's your North Star? And this is an important question. Your North Star is, 
Like what, what's your end game? Like what is all this for? Where, does, where do you want this to take you? Because I love to ask the question, do you work to live or do you live to work? Because most of the busy PTs we see, right, they live to work. They're not working to live. Right? Their whole life becomes around work. Like I said, anything outside of work tends to start taking a hit. So when they understand, oh, no, I, 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 I work to live, not live to work. Go, okay, well, if you work to live, then what's the lifestyle that you want? Right? What is all this for? Get clear on your lifestyle. That, that's your North Star. Where is this going to take you? Right? And a lot of them have no freaking idea. They, they have no idea outside of just you know, the, the week to week. They have no sort of end game in mind. So we get very clear because one of the things I always say to them is that when you get clear on what your end game is, then you get to do something really powerful. And that is you don't build your lifestyle around your work. You build your work around the lifestyle that you want. And then like a light bulb goes off. So going back to this girl, I said to her, when we we're talking about success, I said to her, you know, is there a different way to look at success? So I said, would you consider that you were successful or more successful if you were making the same amount of money in half the time, say 25 hours a week instead of 50? And she goes, well, yeah, I'd, I'd consider that being more successful because we always stress, you know, what's more important, money or time? Now, me personally, I like to say time. Because if we lose money, we can always make more money. But if we lose time, we can't get more time back. So we need to value our time. This is why we try to go, well, how much time do you want to spend doing something? Because for every hour you spend doing this, it's an hour that you can't spend doing the other things that you value in life with the people that you care about, things like that. So stop spending time and learn to invest time. Spending time is when you spend an hour and you get nothing in return for that. Investing time is when you invest an hour and you grow from that, you become more as of that, you know, that, from that experience. So it's always about investing time. And she goes, you know, I'd consider that to be more successful. And I, okay, great. Well, I'm just curious. Let's say that, let's just forecast forward. Let's say that we did that in a year from now, right? You were actually making the same amount of money in half the time. I said, that's 25 hours that you free up a week. And she goes, yeah. And I said, what would you do with that time? How would you, how would you, how would you invest it? If you had an extra 20 hours a week now, where, where would you put it? And she goes, oh, I, I would love to get back to horse riding. I said, oh, why? And she goes, yeah, I haven't had to horse ride since I'm in a PT because I'm always working and I'm always busy. And I went, really? I said, so when did you get into horse riding? Like, what got into horse riding? She goes, oh, when I was a little girl, my dad took me horse riding and all this. I went, oh, so horse riding is pretty important to you. She goes, yeah, I loved it. And it makes me sad that I haven't got time to, and she goes, oh, I see what you've done. And I said, so what do you, what do you think is important now? And she goes, yeah, I need to free up time so I can go back to horse riding. And one of the most rewarding things I've had with a student is that she listened, she restructured everything, and then she sent me this picture of her horse riding again and being happy because she freed up the time without losing the money. And she was getting back to what she loved, which was riding the horses and things like that. So that, yeah. that, that was pretty cool. So, yeah, anyway. It just keeps appearing in my life. Horses, they're everywhere. <laughs> Same, I want to get back to horse riding. That might be your spiritual animal. Hey, maybe. Um, speaking of lifestyle, mm -hmm. you are living in the Dominican Republic and mm -hmm. you are speaking and teaching trainers, obviously, because you're good at that. So what you're teaching appears to be something that you've actually are on the journey to or have mastered and have got some yep. kind of balance. Can you explain why you were over there? Yeah, I just... When I, when I was young, I, I always kind of liked to vision that the life that I want to have. Like, I, I don't know where I got it from, but I always had this concept, this North Star, like the lifestyle that I wanted to have. And it, it didn't involve, you know, living in a really cold climate, you know, because I, I love the beach. I love the sand. Like, I always had these visions of, of getting up every day to beautiful blue skies, white sand, you know, blue ocean, things like that. And that was always part of my, my North Star, as well as the other thing of what's my idea of success, it's being able to wake up when I want to, not having to have an alarm clock. You know, so my, my days were free to, to do what I enjoy doing with the people I enjoy doing it. So I got very clear on that. And when I met my, my wife, Jimena, you know, one of the things we sat down and we did together, it's called a tree drill. And a tree drill is just where we kind of think about, okay, well, first, what are, what are the roots of a tree, right? So, this represents the I. So we, we look at the relationship through the I, the we, and the all. And the I is kind of, you know, what is it that I need for me? What is it that I value? What are my non-negotiables? How well do we know self? Most people don't know self. 
right? But I got very clear and we just start from a very simple, you know, physical, mental, emotional, spiritual aspect of self. So what are my physical needs? What, and physical need also relates to the environment. Like where do I want to live? Do I want to live in the country? Do I want to live in the city? Do I want to live in an apartment? You know, do I want to live by the ocean? And it's always interesting, like, you know, Nick, who's my, my colleague in, in FMA, you know, when we did this with him, he loves to live in the forest. Like he likes, you know, like the, the bush and, and rivers and, and mountains and stuff like that. Whereas I'm more, I want to be around the ocean and, you know, in the Caribbean and, and those sorts of things. So we all have this natural calling that, that makes us happy. And then we start looking more at the physical in terms of how do we want to nourish yourself? Like what, what do you want to eat? See, one of my highest values is, is to be able to, you know, and the reason why I like to make money is so I can eat the food that I want to eat. That, that's so important to me. So I needed to be with someone who finds that as important to them. Like we need to share certain values like that. You know, how much, how often do I want to train? Where do I want to train? Do I want to train in the gym? Do I want to train outside? You know, I, I, like, I prefer training outside and things like this. And then we go, so we go all, all into our, our physical needs. And then we go into our mental, emotional, like what, what are the things that I value? So I, I value learning. Like learning is one of my highest values um, in teaching and high value friendships and things like that. And then we go to the spiritual, like, you know, my, my desire to step into my, my purpose for being, which is more around growth and contribution. You know, how I want to give back, how I want to contribute, what I, what I want to give, you know, and this is why my, my journey now, it's, it's not so much about trying to build like brick and mortar monuments to myself as a legacy. It's more about how many lives can I impact and touch so that when I'm on my deathbed and I look back at the life I've had, I know that I've made a difference. The world has become a better place because I was in it sort of thing. That's what kind of drives me. This is why I'm so driven to you know, try to help and share and, and contribute as much as I can to people's development and things. So Hemi and I, we sat down and we went through that process and we looked at how compatible are we you know, at, at a root level. Um, like to, to give you an example with that, you know, her friend, Marita, who's one of her best friends, just goes, man, I don't know how you could live on an island. It's too boring. She likes to be high society. She likes to be having dinner parties, having people over, you know, going out to things. I couldn't be with someone like that. You know, it's like my home is, is, is my safe space. It's my, my, my sacred space. It's not something I don't really want to open up to having public coming in and dinner parties and dining and stuff like that. So, you know, you start to, when you have these real conversations, you start to realize how compatible you are or not compatible with someone, you know, straight, straight away. And him and I were just very much, like we were very similar on pretty much everything. And the, the reason we ended up here is because like I said, you know, I didn't want to live in New Zealand, you know, cold climates. I wanted to be on the beach and all this. Him was the same. And to take it one step further for, you know, the conspiracy theorists out there as well, it's I always wanted to be able to have an opt-in, opt-out lifestyle. So I wanted to opt-in to enjoy the world, you know, and, and art and, and, and all that sort of stuff, um, you know, but I really wanted to have an opt-out lifestyle, which is very self-sustaining. So if the grid went down and there's all these sorts of problems, right? Because we kind of foresee a lot of stuff that was coming up. Um, it wasn't going to impact me as well. And Hemi was down that rabbit hole with me. Right? She loved all that stuff too. And she foresaw a lot of that stuff. So we actually packed up and we, we first moved to Fiji. We were going to live in Fiji because it's close to Australia where a lot of my work was and stuff like that. And we got very close. We were there for six weeks and we wanted to buy land there. We we're going to build. And we kind of didn't go through the traditional stuff like, you know, realtors and that. We went out and met a lot of the tribal village, you know, the chiefs and stuff and did ceremonies with them. And then we got the opportunity to buy a whole lot of land right on the beach with fresh water and fertile soil. It was beautiful. But then right at the last minute, the Fijian government um, changed the policy on freehold land. And because we weren't citizens so that you, you couldn't really buy freehold land. It, it, it went to chaos and stuff like that. So we had to leave basically. Um, and that's how we ended up in the Dominican Republic. So we thought, well, let's try it here because my wife's from Colombia and it's close to her, her family. And she had a friend that was living here and they said, man, it's just as beautiful as Fiji, but it's got like a first world infrastructure, which we didn't really have access to in Fiji. And then we were just lucky enough that we moved here. We ended up in Katkana, which is one of the biggest gated communities. Um, and it's amazing. Look, if you get a chance to Google map it and have a look, yeah. it's phenomenal. Like it's just, it's got one of the, the biggest marinas. It's got like restaurants everywhere, um, massive infrastructure. 
So like if the grid went completely down, you know, in, in the Dominican Republic, this place would still keep running because they've got everything they need to be self-sustaining and stuff like that. So it's, it's pretty cool. So we, we're living the, the lifestyle that, that I always wanted to live. And so what now then for you? Um, Where's the North Star now if you're actually already in the other universe on the star? Are you yeah. on the star? <laughs> it's been interesting because, you know, with COVID and stuff, it, it threw everyone a curveball. So, it, it, you know, I used to be leaving here and flying to Australia three times a year um, for immersions and teaching and, and their mastermind program and stuff. And then COVID sort of caused the, you know, put the brakes on that. So it's been two years since I've been in Australia and, and New Zealand. Um, so that's caused us to kind of have to course creep what we're doing, you know, because we couldn't do things the way that we're doing it. So that's, that's been interesting. It's, it's, it's made us have to, you know, kind of look at things differently. And I always say in business, you know, business is about how well you can adapt. That's what, to me, what business is about. And there's many things that will come up, like and a lot of PTs will experience this, where, you know, your niche is the same, but their problems have changed. And now what you have to do has to become a solution, a part of the solution to the new problems that they're experiencing. And that's how you survive. So we had to kind of look at our business through that lens and go, shit, we needed to adapt. Um, and a lot of our students were having different problems that we needed to, to step up and help support them with them as well. So everything's kind of evolved and changed a lot. But I think one of the interesting things was, and we can talk a bit about the, the social media here, I think it's a good segue in, is, you know, back in the day, I, I built FMA purely by just doing like workshops, and just traveling around, getting in front of people. Because I always believe like, you know, um, when you get in front of people, you know, within five minutes of talking, people will know if you're full of shit or not. So that to me was always, was always the best marketing. You know, which is like a show and tell, like, you know, get in there, teach some stuff, get hands on with people, fix things on the spot, show them what you can do, showcase your skill set. And that's how I built FMA, you know, and this is why I've never really had a big social media sort of presence because I've never needed to. And I've always been a kind of a very sort of quiet sort of private person, um, you know, and it's, it's been interesting now because now things have changed. You know, I'm, and I'm kind of on the other side of the world. Now I'm having to go, okay, well, I need to adapt as well because it's not as easy for me now to jump on a plane and go and showcase what I do in public, you know, to people. So we've got to start doing things online, which means, okay, we need to start building more ways of getting in front of people in the online space, which means I have to do something which I've avoided very successfully for pretty much my entire working life. You know, I'm 50 next week. And I've never really done anything with social media, but now I'm having to step into that and adapt and starting a, a new journey. So our offers have evolved to be more online. And now I'm going to have to evolve to more, you know, stepping into the online space to, to get reach and things like that. And that's where a certain Kate Martin's going to be popping up. Isn't it, Kate? <laughs> um, only from having to use it ha having to use it actually i used to make videos for clients in 2012 because i was sick of repeating myself running groups saying the same thing by thursday you know hundreds of times yeah um and so i'd make videos before facebook and then keep them unlisted on youtube and connect lists of them together and then share that series of stories with a person that might um ask about you know, I want to come and help. I want to come and lose weight post baby or something. And I thought, oh, okay, I know what I need to share with you, which was that series of videos. I didn't make it on purpose to market. So if there's anything that any coaches, including yourself, get to know, it's the whole relationship that we already know how to have, that coaching stuff. That is actually the genius behind anything that we do with social media and marketing, et cetera. It's not as hard as you think when you get some basic principles down yeah. pat it's just a matter of spending a little bit of time doing it so do you think it's actually possible to teach an old dog new tricks oh well, we're going to find out and just just people listen to this kind of realize what we mean by an old dog and can we teach new tricks you know this this is where kate's gonna have a hands for because you know have you known anyone to not have a mobile phone uh i don't know no probably probably not but it's not it's not yeah, so I, I find I it shocking that you don't. Yeah, but I, I have not owned a mobile phone for over 10 years now. So Good. all the time that I was traveling, going to Australia, lecturing and all this, never had a phone, didn't use a phone. 
you know, which used to drive people nuts because they couldn't get a hold of me. But I always say, look, you know, I, I check my emails morning and night. So, you know, I will, I will see a message. But there's this whole culture. I was like, yeah, but I need you now. I need to, to talk to you right now. I said, like, well, you can't. <laughs> and I, I, the, one of the reasons why I chose to do that is because, you know, to me, connection is very important. So, you know, I just sit back and I watch how many people, like how disconnected people are today. Mm. You know, we're, we're more connected than ever, but we're more disconnected than ever as well. And it just saddens me to see, you know, you, you go to a restaurant and you see a family sitting there and they're all just on their phones like this the whole time, like that. Mm. And the other thing too is it's crazy with a lot of personal trainers, right? How bad they've got at actually having conversations with people. They're so used to texting and, and doing all that sort of like forms of communication. They've actually lost the art of actually talking to people and connecting and being able to read body language. Like we, we tell them that, you know, you've got to be very aware that when you communicate, only around 7% of what you communicate is verbal. The other like 93% is the non-verbal. Mm. And they have no idea of the non-verbal like this, you know? So this is why so many PTs are having a hard time. Like I know you do a lot with people in the online space, but we coach people more in, you know, in who actually work in the gyms. They've got to sit down and have real conversations with people and they just don't know how to connect. And would and they be of a certain age group as well? Because the people that I work with generally to do with helping them, if it's a personal training with their business, they're usually closer to my age. So mm, had a phone the whole the life. They're not in their twenties. They're not in their twenties, my clients. Yeah. And they, and it's funny because, you know, not only do they have a hard time communicating, but they get so nervous at the idea of sitting down and having a conversation with a stranger, but they can't even make eye contact. Yeah. So you can think about it from the perspective, you imagine if you go to a doctor, someone who you're entrusting with you help, you know, solving a health problem and the doctor looks really uncomfortable and can't even make eye contact when, when they're talking to you. It's like, you, you're going to go, well, this doesn't feel right. Right. Because that's not how someone who's like an authority would, would show up and act. So it creates uncertainty and people always lean out during times of uncertainty, you know, and we see this more and more with PTs. So we spend so much time just sitting down with them, teaching them how to have a conversation, how to make eye contact, how to smile, how to use tonality, how to be engaging in conversation, conversational in conversation, like just basic things like that. It, it's fascinating. It really is fascinating. You can definitely it's definitely at the forefront of one of the things that's wrong, quote unquote, with the world. But I think that humanity at the moment is going to implode on itself. Really. You know, you have to kind of get to breaking point or boiling point before things change. And mm. human relationships is definitely one of the things that shines a light on the issue with that anyway, that's for sure. But I'm sure, yeah. I'm sure we'll come full circle. I think that they've chosen to be here at this time for whatever they're here for, right? I can only think that I have a 14 year old. She's definitely here for a mission. Even she knows it actually. Um, <laughs> I could keep asking you a million questions, but I'm conscious of your time. So yes, maybe we'll run a, some kind of social media challenge for old dogs. I, I remember it was about 10 years ago when I was starting to get in this space, the thing that, and it, it shines a light on the fact that the people that, everyone thinks are the best trainers in the world because they've done their research to find them and now they're doing an online program with them. Not that they're not good trainers, but those trainers are actually good at marketing themselves. Mm. And it's, it's the double-edged sword. It's like selling yourself and then you've got to market yourself as well. But it really is hard. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and I've learned, yes, people can do it. It's still important that you learn how to do it yourself. So yes, let's run some kind of, social media challenge for old dogs because it's so important that people like yourself, Paul Check, Louis Simmons, <laughs> be still around. Um, he passed away. So I should have known that. Um, but it's important that these people, I think it's important that these people get the word out there. They don't necessarily have to do it themselves, but if they knew a few things, it would, it would definitely help. Yeah. That's for sure. So that's definitely a mission. Let's get that done. Any last final statements, Mr. Buckley? Um, no, I mean, I'm, I'm happy talking. I could keep talking. If you wanted to ask more things, we could wrap it up. Or whatever works for you. Well, what do you want to do with the social media thing? Let's talk about the social media thing. As in, if we're going to teach an old dog new tricks, what does the, why, you mentioned this to me. Why don't we teach an old dog new tricks? I need to learn new tricks. What are you talking about? 
Yeah, it, it's just, it's quite funny. It's like, um, like I know a lot about marketing and selling, but I don't know a lot about using the toys and the gadgets. That, that's what I mean, old dog new tricks. Like I, I don't even have a phone. So when Hemi gives me a phone and she goes, I'll do something on WhatsApp, I go, what's WhatsApp? What, you know, like I'm, what are we doing here? Sort of thing. So yeah, for me, it's like, I mean, I felt so like successful today, like had a big achievement because I put up a reel myself. <laughs> but that is a big deal. I know, but everything's challenging because I had to do it without a phone. So it meant I had to go on Chrome and then get a Chrome extension called something, I can't remember what it's called now, that then brought up like a little phone on my, my Mac. And then I was able to add the reel, you know, and, and do it like that. You know, so there's, there's always these little technical things that I've, I've got to, you know, figure out and work around. But I, I'm just hoping that I can do, actually, you can answer this. Am I able to do all the stuff like with Instagram? Because often they're, they're not like, you know, like uh, Mac friendly. It's more about the app and the phone mm. sort of thing. Yeah. It, but does that apply? Like if I've got an iPad, can I do the same things with an iPad that you would on the phone? Good point. No, I don't know. We'd just have to try it. And even if this is how quick it changes, even if I did know the answer in two or three months, it will be totally different. And Instagram's changing a lot at the moment to become more yeah. user-friendly like that. Mm. So no, I don't know the answer anyway. And I'm by no means a guru. I've just learned to approach it like a five-year-old or a 10-year-old and press the buttons and figure out how to get it to work because it's not going to break me. It did emotionally break me 2012 when I was trying to set up a, an, an email, you know, an automated email sequence thing with software that does all that stuff for you. And I yeah. threw my laptop off the table. This was before I meditated. I got cranky really quickly. <laughs> oh, ridiculous yeah. expensive mistake, that one. Like, yeah. and why? Because I, I always think everything's going to take two minutes, but it doesn't. Um, which is why, which, but it's okay, but it's why a busy coach, when they know what's actually going to move the needle, I like to liken it to, um, you know, getting a result with the body. When you know how to get a result with their body in the first couple of weeks of working with you, people are then internally motivated to do what you say and to keep doing it themselves. Mm. And business, I think, apply it to technology. It's all the same. When you do yeah. something and you actually get a result from the thing that has got nothing to do with, how many people see the thing in the algorithm, the way you should be measuring the algorithm is, are you making more sales technically, I think. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, which actually, you know, because you've hired marketing agencies and sometimes they don't connect what it's meant to make sales. Yeah, and I, I think you, you put it the best there. It's like, um, I just kind of need to know how to move the needle using social media. Because it, that's the thing, you know, like, I love to learn as well. Like it's, you know, it's one of the highest values. So I'll spend a lot of time looking into these things. Um, and, you know, and I know that I've got to start executing, but there's just so much misinformation and mixed opinions out there on what to do, what not to do. I kind of look at it and go, I've got no experience doing that stuff myself. And I really don't want to take the time to go through the process to find out what's working, what's not working. So, you know, I love the idea of sitting down with someone like yourself who's, you know, stress test a lot of stuff and you have the knowing. So I just have some knowledge, but you have the knowing. You know, you've got experience with it. And that, that's what I think is going to be really helpful. What I'd like to say, like I, I'm by no means a guru. I've just, I've found some gurus that I can ask questions of. Yes, I've done some expensive courses that I don't recommend that you, that you even need to do. What I've noticed as well is because we're used to people's time and attention and probably a little bit more extroverted rather than introverted, the digital marketing space is full of, introverts that aren't used to talking instead they're used to you know building funnels and doing all that kind of stuff but what mm. we have on our side and, and all coaches have on their side is when you can conversate and understand you know the real needs of a human emotion and the words that they say and all that kind of, that's the mark we know how to do it all we really do know yeah. how to do it all so it's not really that complex and I was thinking about this after our first conversation and thought perhaps the easiest thing to do would be to have a container, like a group of us, for example, and we actually execute the stuff together. Like we learn everybody's quick story and mm -hmm. then give everybody a task and we do it while you're online together because the worst thing to do is, I think, send people away and, you know, you, you have trouble with yeah. some technology and then nothing happens and then you get frustrated yeah. and you've got to go and have dinner, so it's over. Um, but yeah. we stay online and in that hour you, you action, you know, whatever yeah. the one or two steps are. That would be perfect. And to have you there to catch my computer if I throw it. 
<laughs> you better be pretty good at what is that javelin shot put from there you literally it's 10 10 p.m there no 7 p.m 7 30 7 30 yeah technically the other side of the world mm -hmm. yeah yes i'm going to do that tree exercise actually that's really sounds really really interesting yeah i just want to think um what i'll do is i'll give you access to my coaching course so we got a like a coaching course we put people into it's a free course by the way i'm not, I'm not selling to you right now so you can relax but there's it I goes like being sold to i know you know how when you study psychology there's the medium mean and then there's the outliers i'm an outlier yeah. on all of it i love being sold to some of the stuff some of the stuff tell me all about all that stuff yeah. and i don't have an allergy to selling or being sold to anyway i i actually love it as well like i get hit up so often like the, the, the big thing right now is you, you join a group like a business group you know and then someone will put a thing up saying hey i did this for such and such client you know if you want to learn more or you want the, the playbook you know just say interested or something so of course i like to see things but it, it's funny because like the moment you do that it's like all the vultures come out like that and you see so all that all oh, there's 20 people that want to friend me from that group and they all give you the same line like hey how are you I've noticed in the group and stuff and then they start pitching to you like this and i i find it interesting like i love seeing like i firstly i tip my hat off to people that have the courage to do that you know they're getting out there and they're doing it and i was talking to a lady today you know and and she did a, a really bad job at it you know and <laughs> and at the end of it i just kind of said hey look look you know actually i'm i'm not interested in that i'm not you know i'm not looking for that and she's oh okay okay and then i just finished and said but you know what i just want to say like I get that what you're doing is, is really hard to do. And I actually appreciate you taking the time to connect to see if, if you could help me with something. So, you know, thank you, I appreciate you. And she was oh, like, it just blew away. Cause I know so many people tell them to fuck off and all this, but you know, we, we've got to be more supportive in this space. And so I love giving people the opportunity in that. But going back to the, the course, it's in there, the last, the last section is the tree drill, where I kind of talk about it. Okay. Yep. Um, yeah, but, the whole course you'll be like it's just it's four modules where i take someone through a coaching session it gets pretty heavy like well, the like side comes up and and some pretty heavy stuff that we coach mm -hmm. someone through and then we finish off with the, with the tree drill so i think mm -hmm. you'd enjoy it. so i'll give you access to that so you can jump and if you just want to see the tree drill only you can just jump straight to the fourth module can we obviously i was i should also say forgot to ask you sorry are there any links of free things that we can give away and i'll make sure that they're all near this video as well and what will they be? Will it be the free course with you guys? Yeah, and no, I can give you a link to share once that gets you into the um, the hybrid training course. So that's the first step in learning how to be a hybrid trainer that can bridge the gap between sort of rehab S and C. So it's it's very simple. Like it's just your first step. We're not trying to overwhelm you, but you know, there's four parts. The first part is um, sort of breaking down key concepts around program design. Um, a lot of things that you know most PTs need to know but never get taught so we kind of just kind of break things down really well there um, then we go into coaching and that, that's the big thing we spend a lot of time teaching people how to coach it's one of the biggest roles and responsibilities we have when we work with someone and getting people to start understanding why people you know do the things they do or avoid doing the things they do understanding the psychology behind things like for the people listening this is might be quite interesting but you know when you start to understand how the human mind works you know, one of the questions, if I'm having a bit of a, like a, a sales conversation or a very quick coaching conversation for the students, you know, we might kind of go down the, the path of asking questions. We might say to them, okay, so what's the result that you're looking for, you know, and why is that important? But we'll always ask about priority, you know, and for right now, like we're looking at desire. How, how important is that for you right now? Like what's, what's the priority on one to 10? And if someone doesn't score at least an eight, then we know their readiness to buy is not high enough. So there has to be work done because if you start trying to position what you do, it's, it's not going to go anywhere. But uh, off the back of that, the key questions I, I get them to ask is things like, um, you know, say someone's struggling with weight, right? And they're, they're looking to lose weight. We'll sort of ask a question along the lines of, okay, so how long have you been struggling with eggs before? So, so how long have you been struggling with weight for? And from that answer, you can tell so much about them. So when someone kind of says, you know, oh, I've been struggling my whole life with weight. I've already been battling with weight, struggling with weight. Right? Now we know that the odds are stacked against them in terms of being successful. Because when you start understanding basic psychology, that the way that the mind works is if somebody has always been struggling with something and they have a history of failing, right? well, the part of the brain that lights up when you think about the future is the same part of the brain that lights up when you think about the past. See, the mind is designed to anticipate outcome. 
it expects more of the same. And it's that part of the self that doesn't believe that the present or the future can be any different to the past. So this is why we see it so often when people go, I want to lose weight. And you go, okay, let's look at desire. How important is this to you? you go, oh, it's really important. Okay, so on a scale of one to 10, how important is it? You know, and they can go, oh, it's a 10. Like, I really need to do this. And you go, okay, cool. And you might even get into, you know, the why and how would that make you feel if you're successful? All that stuff that people kind of like to talk about. But I've learned that that doesn't really mean shit, right? Because at the end of the day, there's a part of them that really wants it. But there's the other part of them, which is their attitude to it in terms of how they really feel about it, right? So if somebody has a history of failing, they anticipate more failing. So they've already lost ahead of time. And this is with the people that you go, okay, cool, I can help you with that. You know, this is what we'll do. This is how much it's going to cost. And then you go, what the fuck? They just lent out. One minute they're saying it's a 10 out of 10, they've got to have it. And now the energy collapses and they go, I need to think about it. I'll talk to my partner. Right? It's because they've already anticipated failing. And so many times when you call someone out on it, you go, look, I saw what happened there. It's like when we talked about price, the first thing that went through your mind was, I can't afford to lose that much money if you're selling something high ticket. But that's what losing ahead of time looks like because they don't trust themselves. Right? It's a really important thing. So, you know, we kind of connect with that and learn how to coach someone through that because the biggest tip I can give people is that, you know, if you really want someone to take action, they've got to actually expect to be successful. They've got to see it as something that's possible. And if they don't see it as possible, they're not going to act. They're going to lean out. They're not going to lean in. So a story I love to share was I was helping a lady who was, um, she had this really severe motor neuron disorder. And the doctor said that it was progressive and degenerative. So she first came to my wife. My wife did a lot of coaching and healing work with her and got a, got a lot stronger. And then I came in and started doing the rehab because it looked like she had a severe stroke. Like she had massive atrophy or wasting away of both legs. And she couldn't walk. She'd walk like 10 meters and she'd have to sit down, hold the wall. And she walked like a stroke. Well, someone had a stroke. Like she was swaying and had to keep balancing herself. You just had to poke her and she'd fall over sort of thing. And we sat down and we said, look, what is it that you really want to achieve? And she goes, I don't want to end up in a wheelchair, right? The doctor said it's going to be progressive, degenerative. I'm going to end up in a wheelchair. And I said, okay, so you don't want that to happen. She goes, no. And she goes, I've been working on my mindset. Like I'm not going to identify with the disease and all, saying all the right things. So we decided to set a goal because they said that she, in a year's time, like she wouldn't be able to walk, right? So I said to her, I said, how would you feel if in a year's time we walked 10 kilometers? We did a 10K walk. And she was like, oh, I'd love that. And I said, Ruby, she was, yeah. And I said, so what would that mean to you? And she was, oh, it would mean freedom. It means that, you know, I'm not going to be in a wheelchair and I can have my life back and all this sort of stuff. And I said, do you want to do it? And she says, yeah, I want to do it. And I said, hang on, before we, we do that, we need to check in. And I make them close their eyes, put their hand on their heart. And I said, right, I want you to close your eyes and I want you to connect with how you really experience this dis-ease that you have, right? I know you don't identify it, but there is a physical reality going on in your body right now. And I want you to think about everything that you know about yourself and how you show up for things. Do you really believe that it's possible that in a year's time, you'll be able to walk 10K or that you would ever be able to walk 10K? And she started to cry and she goes, no, there's not one part of me that believes that that's possible. And I said, that's why it's not going to happen. And I said, do you want to find out what's possible? And she went, yeah. So we kept going down 5K, 3K, 2K. Same thing, she's crying, feeling absolutely helpless, hopeless. No, I can't do that. I can't even walk across the room without having to stop and I'm out, you know, blah, blah, blah. And then we got down to 1K. And I said, do you believe it's possible that you could walk 1K? And she looked up and she goes, a part of me believes that's possible. And I said, good, I need one part of you to believe and we can make this happen, right? We start today. And we started, fast forward 12 months on the day that we said we'd do it, we got video footage of her crossing the 10 kilometer walk and she did it. Yeah, it was one of the, we did a whole little documentary on it, like filmed it yeah. and, and stuff like that. And see, that, that's the power of, you know, it's, it's got to be possible for someone to lean and take action. So one of the big things we do as coaches, especially with selling, is we've got to take the time to take someone and shift the expectation. So like I said, that question is so important because like I said, if someone has a history of failing, but they will talk a big game, they go, I want it and it's so important, I need to do it. But underneath that, there is a part of that saying, but it's not possible right? You know, the, the, the present or the future can't be any different to the past. And they've already lost ahead of time. And they may start with you, but they've got one foot in, one foot out. And the moment things get tough, they lean out. And I think a lot of trainers will, will recognize that, that behavior. It happens a lot. So yeah, coaching, 
going back to the that first module, the personal that programming, then we kind of give you a bit of a framework around coaching. We kind of talk a bit about that stuff, like how we understand coaching um, with our clients. And then the third part, we go into a case study review. And it's quite interesting where we go, you know, what would you do if you were training a female client that wanted to get stronger, but was getting shoulder pain and hip pain under the bar when they lift? And how do we address the shadow side of the athlete archetype? Because this lady was a bit of an athlete. So I bring some of the coaching principles in as well. Um, so yeah, so that, that's kind of the, the, the first one. And then the, the coaching one, we can give away a link to the free coaching course. Okay. And that's, that, that's a bit heavier. That, that's me real time coaching someone. And it comes up in, a, in a, one of these calls. It goes for about two hours. And the first part is we, we talk about the problem um, the second part, we get to the, the real truth. So a lot of people deceive themselves. And the first part of the conversation, there's a lot of resistance and stuff. And then we kind of broke through that resistance. And then the truth came out, the tears, the thoughts about suicide and all that stuff came out. So we had to deal with that. Wow. Then the guy had to go, which we knew. He said he had a client coming in. Um, so he wrapped it up. Then I did like a bit of a debrief on what we saw. And then the fourth part is the, the North Star drill. We go more to the, the North Star and things like that. So I can give those two links available. So whoever's viewing, they can get both links um, or just choose one, whatever they want. Yeah. It's easy. Amazing. Thank you. And no I know you could keep talking. You'd keep talking for eight hours because you're so generous. And that's actually the other thing that I swear still tops social media anyway is I remember you at the front of the room multiple times in that clinic in Bondi Junction because I just happened to work there. So I got to be lucky and listen but in one particular course that I was paying for that I was listening to. And that was 15 years ago and seminars and face-to-face -face and all the trainers that have done anything face-to-face -face, relationship wise, conversation wise with a human being will always trump uh, in a human being's memory bank versus anything that they scroll on technology. Yeah. So, yeah absolutely. And I, I mean that from the perspective that those relationships are still there it's still possible to reconnect with those people. It's still possible to help those people decades later, potentially. Um, yeah. And this is what I love about experienced coaches that I usually end up helping with. Sometimes they are on social media already. Sometimes they often, sometimes they don't even have Facebook so that I could message them on there. Uh, they might've just found the website. So they're quite, quite, not a, some of them have phones. Most of them have phones. I have to say that they're not usually that, but I know you're doing that on purpose, which is actually cool. Can you teach me how to do social media. I've got a dial up phone here. <laughs> do you know how to spell social on there <laughs> I keep trying to, I keep trying to oh the dial up phone what even is that <laughs> yeah, I, I keep dialing Instagram but there's no answer so I can't oh, get on oh no oh gosh wow we're really showing our age <laughs> what a dial up phone is um, and my point is I guess that once, once it does work and it's quite simple and easy to get it to work then all the people from the last 15, 20 years that have heard you and or every other trainer have an interaction with and speak to their clients or not even clients, potential clients, free visits, all that stuff, then they find you and they reignite and it's, it's reignited. They remember. It's, you know, the person that they follow on Instagram is not as meaningful as the conversation that you had. When you so generously give your time because us personal trainers are always generously giving time in conversation mm -hmm. to potential clients. Anyway, very exciting. So I'll make sure that there's a link around this video as well for wherever that group container is going to be for whatever the social media thing is that we're going to do. And maybe we'll have some more conversations about that and launch it properly when we decide what it is actually going to be. <laughs> what the outcome will be, of course, has to be outcome driven. Now, the outcome is actually to get more visibility, to get more sales of whatever it is that you're selling technically. Yep. Yeah. Too easy. Thank you so much again for your time, Mark. No worries. It's been fun. We'll talk to you again soon. And guys, you have to jump on the links that he's put, put near this video because it's very generous and you will be absolutely blown away because we didn't even really get into technical stuff today. But thank no. you again. And what we can do as well, if, if your yep. viewers want more technical type stuff, yep. just give us some ideas of what they want to hear and I can come back and we can have fun talking about those. Happy to do that. Okay. All right. All right. I definitely will. Cool. Thank you so much again for your time. I'll talk to you soon. No All right. Bye.